Hey, what's up everyone? And welcome to this slightly different video on how to rear Lepidoptera from eggs all the way through to larger individuals and adults as well. And it will just be a step-by-step -step guide, a few tips on overwintering things, uh, breeding maybe as well. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so we're going to start with eggs. Now it may be that you've purchased some eggs or you found some eggs on food plant or you've had a female moth in the moth trap and she's laid eggs. So here I have some uh, Lassiocamba quercus eggs. Ignore what it says, these are not Cirrorovinula eggs. Um, they were before, but no, these are oak egg eggs. These were laid by the female that I caught in my moth trap, so that's very pleasing. So eggs can be kept in containers like this. This is just a flat plastic container with a bit of kitchen towel. Uh, if you have smaller species, uh, eggs can be kept in things like that or smaller plastic boxes as well. And they can even be kept in things like this when they hatch as well. For first instar larvae, I'll probably keep them in here for now. Uh, it's big enough, fits some food plant in there. However, when they get larger, I'll probably move them into here. So again, ignore what it says. These are not Saturnia pyri over. These are in fact first instar um, Sphinx ligustri, privet hawk moth caterpillars. So I've got a fair few Sphinx Ligustri larva in here. And again, like it said on the lid, um, I did keep my giant peacock moth eggs in here. So for larger species, you can also keep eggs in here as well. Just make sure if the container does have air holes in it, um, they're not big enough for any larvae to escape. But I keep first instar larvae in boxes like these. So you can see Privet Hawk moth caterpillars under there on their food plant. Um, I will change the food plant every day, um, sometimes every other day if it stays fresher, but usually every day, and clean out the container as well. When I'm doing that, I will move the larvae with a soft paintbrush like this one into another pot, such as this one, temporary uh, holding container, and then I will clean out the container, put some new kitchen towel in, some new food plant, and then transfer the larvae again with the paintbrush from the temporary container back into there. So it is fairly simple, even though I've probably just made it sound complicated. Uh, but it does keep the larvae happy. Uh, wouldn't handle first or second instar larvae just because they're so delicate and small. Uh, in fact, I try not to handle most of my larvae unless I have to. But they're doing quite well in here. And if you do have first instar larvae or even eggs that don't hatch or first instar larvae that die, don't worry, it's perfectly nat natural at the small size. It's natural to lose a few. Um, but don't worry, you'll still get some survivors. So yeah, let's move on. Okay then, moving on, we have a larger plastic container. Again, this can be used for first, second, maybe even third instar larvae of smaller moths. So in here I have third instar larvae of Calatera pudibunda, the pale tussock, which is a species that is fairly common. I featured it on my channel before in moth traps, but the caterpillars are really cool looking. I'll uh, get the macro lens on them actually. There we go, so these are the third instar Calatera pudibunda larvae up close. And again, when, I, when I'm changing the food plants, I will transfer the um, larvae into a temporary container with a paintbrush so as to not damage them, put some new food plant in, clean them out. As you can see, they produce rather a lot of frass, and then put them back in. And the frass is one of the reasons as well why I stand the containers up. If I laid them flat, then the frass would just fall amongst the leaves. Whereas if it's up, standing up like that, then the frass can fall to the bottom and the caterpillars can feed on the clean leaves at the top. So they're doing quite well in there. If you have second, third instar larvae of larger moths, such as the Sphinx Ligustri, uh, you can use large boxes like this. Uh, these are just mealworm tubs, um, cleaned out of course, or even larger ones like that. And again, stood up with the food plant uh, either wrapped in a bit of wet kitchen roll or changed every day to make sure it's fresh and stood up so that the frass falls to the bottom. So there are another couple of containers we can use and we'll move on to our mesh enclosures. Okay then, so beyond uh, second instar, for most third, fourth instar larvae and fifth instar larvae, um, I will use mesh enclosures. Um, they tend to need more ventilation and oxygen as they get larger so that's why I upgrade them so in here it doesn't look like there's much but if I 
lift this up, you can just about see, sort of down there, they are third instar Spilosoma lubricipeda, the white ermine larvae. And I really like that species. They are really common. I catch loads in the moth trap, um, but really beautiful species of tiger moth. And the caterpillars as well, really funky. They have a red stripe down there. Backs and are really fluffy. And they move quite fast as well. Um, they feed on a wide range of herbaceous plants, nettle, dandelion, ragwort, dock, things like that. But yeah, so again, um, it's slightly different for these. If they're larger larvae that are in these, larger than, larger than these, I will just cut the stems of the food plant they're on rather than moving the larvae to a temporary enclosure and then place the stems back in with the new food, let the caterpillars move on their own accord onto the new food and then remove the old food as soon as I can. But for these, I'll probably just move them to a temporary enclosure again while I'm putting new food in there. But they're growing on nicely, those. And again, in here, I'll show you what I've got in here. So in this enclosure, I have my lovely fourth and early fifth instar. These two are fifth here. The rest of them are fourth. Uh, fourth and fifth instar, Saturnia pavonia, emperor moth larvae. And they are gorgeous moths. I have featured them on my channel before. Well, a female that hatched. Strangely coloured female. Um, but they are beautiful. Britain's only native silk moth. And the larvae are super fun to rear as well. Hawthorn, heather, bramble, willow are uh, amongst some of the food plants used. I have six larvae that I just got from sweep netting up at a local heath. And they're doing quite well on hawthorn at the moment. Again, they're in sort of a small mesh enclosure. If there was more of them, I'm moving them to something that size, or if, when they get slightly larger. Uh, these have just molted into fifth instar. When they get slightly larger, I'll uh, move them up. This one's having a munch here. Look at him, hungry. Very hungry. So that's why it's important to keep the food plant nice and fresh for them so that they get the nutrition they need to grow. But yeah, super cool. Um, shock horror, I have nothing in here at the moment. This is completely empty. Uh, I did have giant peacock moth larvae in here. We'll get onto those later though. Uh, but this is another large sort of pop-up mesh enclosure that I will use for larger fourth and fifth instar caterpillars. And with these, there's enough room to place the uh, food plant stems in a small pot of water, like the pot I've got over there. Small pot of water. Uh, with something over the top so that the larvae can't fall in and drown. Um, stand the stems up, there's enough height to do that, and that just helps keep the food plant nice and fresh, so I don't have to go out every day looking for food for them. But this is quite a nice, quite a nice net for them. Sometimes I'll also keep female moths in here that release pheromones when they emerge, and um, try and attract males using that technique. But yeah, another Another cool enclosure to keep larvae. Uh, we'll move on to this one. Possibly my most exciting one of them all. So there's a lot going on in this enclosure. There's actually a um, peacock butterfly that's just emerged. Look at that, gorgeous. So I had my peacock larvae in this net before when they were larvae. And uh, now they are all pupae. Hanging nicely up there. And, in fact, there's another one that's emerged up there. Ignore the state of this net, it is filthy. I probably will get a new one. Um, but anyway, the larvae I'm keeping in here at the moment are these. So these are the Saturnia pyri, giant peacock moth larvae. And somewhere in here, I do have a fifth instar one. Yes, these are only fourth instar. And they're already pretty sizable. Pretty sizable larvae, about the size of a fully grown Saturnia pavonia caterpillar, but they will get a lot bigger. Um, there is somewhere amongst this mess of cherry leaves, there he is. Down there is our fifth instar one, the only one at the moment. Absolutely beautiful. And they do put on about 85% of their body size at fifth instar, so they do get about 
for four and a half inches in length, about 10 or 11 centimeters. Um, so yeah, this is the net that I keep larger caterpillars in, butterfly caterpillars, so that they can pupate from the mesh at the top, and larger caterpillars as well. And I also have a few pupae down there as well. These guys are molting into fifth instar, these Saturnia pyri. Um, I also have an atlas moth pupa in here, only because I haven't got another of these large nets, it's the only net large enough I can keep something that big in. And these are a couple of burnet moth Zyganidae um, pupae that I found whilst on a walk. I think they're narrow bordered five spot burnet, which seems to be most common here. And I have another Lassiocamba quercus oak egger cocoon pupa, sorry. Uh, that should be male, I think, as it is fairly small. But yeah, plenty of mesh. I have the food plant standing in water. Um, the water container does have a lid on the top to stop the lava falling in, but a hole so that the stems can go through. But yeah, super excited about rearing these guys. Europe's largest moth, the giant peacock moth. Very, very cool. And look at that peacock over there. Beautiful. And in here are just a few pupae that will overwinter. So these won't hatch until next spring at least. Um, different Lepidoptera, different moths, different butterflies overwinter in different stages. For eggs and pupae, it's fairly straightforward as they are inactive. They can be kept in the fridge if you live in a warmer climate, but if you live in the UK where we have cool, uh, cool winters, they can be kept outside or in an outhouse, just make sure they're in a container strong enough to stop any rodents such as mice getting in, which may eat your pupae. Um, for overwintering larvae, I'm gonna jump over here to my Lassiocampa quercus, uh, which do overwinter as a larvae on the third instar. It can be slightly more difficult as they will sometimes remain active throughout the winter. Uh, for most overwintering larvae though, um, they won't, and you can provide them with some leaf litter, spray them once a week to um, stop them from dry drying out, and then give them food again when the food starts, when the food plant starts to bud in the spring. Uh, it can be tricky, uh, it can, can be done, it is possible. So hopefully I can get much of these through to next spring. Um, for the majority of butterflies, well, especially butterflies such as Peacock, Red Admiral, Commerce, Small Tortoiseshell. Um, much of their life cycle takes place over just one year, so you can go from egg to adult in the same year, not have to worry about overwintering. But for moths, they mainly overwinter. Much of them as pupae, but some do overwinter as larvae, so do take care. I hope this video was helpful. I'm going to finish on this. Doesn't look like much, but this here is a Cirrura vinula, Puss Moth Cocoon. It is one of the strongest cocoons in the moth world, as hard as the bark around it, as the larvae do incorporate chewed pieces of bark when making their cocoons. And that will overwinter as well, hatch next April. And I'll just keep that in the shed in a mesh enclosure, but that is unbelievably, unbelievably tough. I mean, not even any changing the shape of that. Amazing. So, hope you found this video helpful. And uh, if you haven't tried rearing larvae before, I'm sure many of you have um, reared butterflies before, especially um, as kids, we all did that. But if you haven't reared moths or species you want to rear, then don't hesitate, you know, go for it. They're super cool. Um, and don't, don't let bad experiences get you down. You know, if you do seem to fail at a particular species, then don't let it get you down, just try again with a different species or the same species and see how it goes. Sometimes you can just get a bad brood, such as the um, puss moths that I had. A few of them were parasitised, um, two of them were spinning cocoons on here, one of them wandered off into the garden. This is the only one that I've got out of about 10 fifth, fifth in a star larvae that I had. Um, I might get some more though, some more pupae, but yeah, I'm going to finish the video there. Hopefully it's not too much of a long one and hopefully it was helpful so if you did find it helpful then do give it a thumbs up do subscribe if you haven't already and we'll see you on the next one